I feel like these are appropriate conversations to be having, very inspirational stories as the sun is setting after a wonderful day. So I'm excited for the last portion okay. of Thanks. today's uh, gathering. And the next two sessions are opportunities for us to hear extraordinary personal stories from individuals who have faced devastating diseases and not just personal stories as patients, but how they've harnessed their business acumen, they've harnessed their entrepreneurial spirit, and they've harnessed their passion to become catalysts for change, not only within their respective uh, field and within their respective diseases, but also transforming uh, the healthcare industry as we know it and some of the things we heard earlier today as it related to research, drug development, therapies, and ultimately finding a cure. And with that, I want to welcome Kathy Giusti and Scott Johnson. Thank you. Uh, two extraordinary individuals. And I, I'm going to keep your bios short. I'm actually going to leave it up to you guys. And I want to start the conversation and this conversation around what are these new models uh, for, for transforming uh, the cure and development for drugs around diseases and why patients are at the center of this and why now. But I want to do that in the context of each of your individual stories. So Kathy, I'll start off with you and rewind the clock when, as many of us know uh, what that can be like, you got the phone call. Mm -hmm. And how have you been so uniquely positioned to become a catalyst for change through that experience? So um, I was 37 years old um, when I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which um, some of you are probably familiar with, a, a fatal blood cancer. This was back in 1996. At the time, I was told that I would live three years at best. And um, basically what happened at that point in time, I um, was handling worldwide operations for a pharmaceutical company. And so my first instinct was to try to understand what drugs were in the pipeline and you know, if I had any hope at all in this disease. And I have to say for myeloma being a very uncommon cancer, um, there, was, there was nothing in the pipeline at all. So it was a, a time of pure devastation, to be honest with you. I think the great thing for me was the fact that I did have a strong business background and a strong healthcare background. And being told that you, know, you likely will be um, dying in three years, and my daughter was at the time just one year old, I did um, have to walk away from my career um, doing worldwide operations. I had been at Merck and then at Searle at the time. And um, I ended up starting the foundation just to make sure that I could jumpstart research in the disease, not to save my own life, but my alumma had um, run in my family, and I thought perhaps maybe I would jumpstart enough research to at least um, save my daughter's life. So I think the, the great thing about being a patient and seeing where things are going is the fact that I could, I was very in tune with what was happening. So as I was doing second, third, and fourth opinions, and people um, were saying to me, you know, if you're going to the Hutch, could you take down what they're doing in immune therapy? And if you're going here, could you let us know about such and such a trial? I could see there was a need for um, a lot of synergy and communication amongst all the sites. And then um, being an identical twin and having to go in for um, bone marrow biopsies and things like that, it became very obvious to me when all the fellows were outside the door waiting for my fresh tissue, that tissue was going to be something that was critically important as well. And then over time, the more I've learned about my disease, and we talked about this a little bit today, but we've done a lot of research in myeloma, and I, I can talk about how our models work um, later on, but you know, we talked today about how we're breaking down these diseases into smaller and smaller subtypes. And because I live and breathe with this disease and its treatments, and I've been on every treatment, and I've been through stem cell transplant and everything, I do have a sense of, if I have a certain translocation, if I am a certain subtype, what am I going to do about that? How will I find the right trial? How will I find the right doctor? How will I congregate with other patients? And I think we're all learning now, um, you know, in a world of social networking and sequencing and electronic health records that, you know, we do have tissue, we do have data, um, we do know how to work with it. You know, I don't think it's, it, it's not so easy in cancer, but we can make it easier for the patient. And uh, when people are looking for um, groups that they can trust, they trust their doctor, but they also trust um, really well-run organizations like the two that um, Scott and I represent. 
Scott, you had a, a slightly different uh, journey to the point today where you were living with a disease for many, many years mm -hmm. before you were able to leverage your insights and expertise and, and, and your business acumen to try and unearth some of the most critical problems uh, facing the fight, the cure for your disease and the treatments. Talk about when you realized you first actually could be not just an entrepreneur, but an entrepreneur uh, in, in the field of this disease. Well, exactly. So my journey is, is very different than Kathy's. And uh, so um, when I was 20 and an undergraduate, I went blind in one eye and a few months later went numb from the waist down and uh, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And uh, I remember I got a second opinion from a neurologist at uh, UCLA and basically he said, well, he said, I think there'll be a cure in 25 years. Uh, this was back in 1976. And um, he said, you know, just don't stress yourself emotionally or physically. Because he said, they, at the time, they thought that uh, that could cause the disease to be worse. And uh, so I was 20 and relatively fit and kind of ignored that. And I think in retrospect, it's been really good. I pursued a, a business career, um, went back to business school after engineering school, and, and went to a strategy consulting, and then have uh, done some startup companies. And kind of after the requisite 25 years, I realized that really nothing really had changed much. And so, Having run some small businesses, it just struck me that I started looking into how the medical research ecosystem operates. And um, it was interesting to me to see that there were many, many participants. I mean, you've got academic researchers, you've got the NIH, you've got the FDA, you've got pharma, you've got patients, you've got physicians, um, a lot of different participants. And you've got a, a value chain that involves somewhere between, depending on how you define them, maybe 20 or 30 steps to get from discovery to approval. And something that, and, and, and a value chain that currently takes decades. And one of the things that struck me was that there were no, no one of those participants really thought strategically about the entire continuum. And so what we did is try to think, say, let's think about how we can radically um, get involved in that entire value chain and not just take out, you know, maybe five or ten percent of the 30 or 50 years it currently takes, but really drastically reduce that. And so what we did is set out to develop a, a new model that we call our accelerated research collaboration model that we thought could be really a template for all diseases. And we chose, obviously, I have MS and, and thought was let's demonstrate and develop this model on myelin repair. And what myelin is in, in MS, uh, uh, myelin is the coating on your nerves and in your brain and spinal cord. And when that gets damaged, basically the signals get shorted out. So when I tell my right hand to move, it doesn't move because the signal just shorts out basically in between. So the idea is, and when we started this, there was no focus whatsoever on myelin repair. So we were kind of in a greenfield area. And we thought if we could prove the model on that, there'd be no way someone could say, well, you picked an easy indication. And so that's really what we set out to do. And I think what's really different is, to me, it's, I don't really view myself as a patient advocate, interestingly. I really, I really see this as kind of taking a, um, an innovative approach. And it's really a, a Silicon Valley approach. I mean, I'm based in Silicon Valley and I run some startup companies out there. And it's really taking that same approach in just a different venue. And, and, and I think unlike um, Kathy, I had no background in either academic research or the pharmaceutical industry. And I think from taking a look at the entire ecosystem and, and thinking about how to address that, in a way it was an advantage. Mm -hmm. Because I think if I'd been in it, people would say, well, you can't do that, or I would have just assumed you couldn't do it. And so I think it was actually very fortunate that I, I, I didn't have that. And so we've taken a very simple business approach and it's been very effective. One way, obviously, of this new patient empowerment in the process is this extraordinary set of entrepreneurial skills that you can bring to bear. Kathy, you obviously had that in the work that, that you did, but I was also really struck when you talked about this new dynamic of patient empowerment that not only speaks to organizations such as yours, but individuals, and that is on the data side. Changing the stakeholders, changing the relationship of the stakeholders, particularly the patient, who theoretically was at the center, mm -hmm. but actually in practice was not, how has things like advances in genetics and the like also shifted the paradigm 
where patients can be catalysts for change. So I always tell everybody that, um, you know, with myeloma being an uncommon cancer, the most important thing we had to do was create collaborative models. So when we started the foundation, the trick was to get enough scientists into the fold of myeloma. That meant we had to raise enough money and bring them together to do their research together. Once we did that, we then had to move to developing our own clinical network to do phase one and two trials and to do our own tissue banking. And the reason for that was if we wanted to get industry to come, we had to build a model that would make it so easy for biotech to come. So what we ended up doing was we have a, a, a group now of 16 centers that work side by side with us. We've launched about 46 clinical trials of 23 drugs. We've never not finished a trial. Almost all of our drugs, um, because we work with many people to, pick, to select them, are still in trial. In myeloma, we've had five drugs approved. We have a sixth at FDA now, and we've more than doubled the lifespan of our patients. And it's not just us. We take a strategic role. It's much more about how we bring all of the parties together. So I was saying that, and, and the tissue bank has allowed us to accrue high quality tissue and be the first working with the Broad and, and TGen to sequence the myeloma genome, and all that was published in Nature. So we took a breath and we said, wow, that's, that's great. We have been an amazing catalyst since we started the foundation, but we still know myeloma is you know, more like seven or 10 diseases than it is one. How will we find those subtypes? And then how will we identify the cures for each subtype? Well, in order for us to get there, it meant we had to generate data. Um, and we had to generate our own data because if we just build an IT system or an ecosystem and said to everybody in academia and industry, we're going to build this and you all need to dump your data in, we knew that that was unlikely to happen. So we launched our own um, initiative, a $40 million study um, over a period of time where we take 1,000 patients at that moment of diagnosis, that very clean tissue, and we follow them sequentially. We do whole genome, whole, whole exome. Um, and we follow them through complete response and then through remission. And we're, it's all sequential data. Any site working with us, there's 50 had to give up IP, um, and all the data will go into the public domain in an ecosystem that we have built that almost looks a bit like an Amazon-based system. In addition to that, because the study was expensive, we um, developed a pre-competitive consortium. We have four pharmaceutical companies in. I'd be surprised if we didn't have a few more. And um, they get to share the data as well. Um, with an early look at the at window of time. But the, the great thing about this is now getting back to that whole area of crowdsourcing. You know, when I talk to all the centers and I say, what are you going to be doing with this data? I'm always amazed. Like, a community center is just fascinated to go on and see how are certain subtypes being treated. A second, somebody who calls themselves a second tier academic center says, thank you for finally leveling the playing field. We could never get the data from the first tier academic centers, and we wanted to be part of the process. And so we kind of worked it out, just like you said, where everybody is going to have a win-win in this type of model. Now, the patients will still play a role. It's their data. It's, it's good genomic and clinical data sequentially that we're storing, but we're also building a whole patient portal as well, where they start to self-select by their subtypes, and you can imagine a world where the researchers that like that subtype are on there, where clinical trials for that subtype are listing them, and where you can start to create a whole ecosystem where patients are really being knowledgeable specifically about what they need to be knowledgeable about. And I think that's really where putting data in the public domain and allowing thousands of people to look at it and, you know, creating teams um, that can do it well is really going to be the next piece that, that brings speed and change into the system. And I would imagine uh, in, in unprecedented ways, in ways that we can't even imagine right now when we're able to, to harness that, that data. Scott, when you have put this model together, um, obviously data has been a critical component but also creating the value proposition, as, as you mentioned, for each stakeholder. Easier said than done. Right now in this climate, as many are looking to organizations such as yours to be the models moving forward, what are some of the most critical barriers that we each need to focus on? And what are the links right now that have been the most challenging for you to bridge? Uh, good question. And, and there are lots and lots of, of kind of uh, bottlenecks and issues to deal with in the entire continuum. But I'll just talk about two really quickly, I guess. And, and one thing, as you said, one thing that we realized we had to do from the beginning is we can't change, for example, in academic research, we can't change the tenure system and the fact that, that scientists need to publish. But 
we did want to try and, and incent a little different behavior. And so we knew that in every element to, to, to affect change, we needed to add value to the different participants. So for example, in the, in the uh, uh, academic research, where we kind of came at this again at the exact opposite way that Kathy did, where Kathy started, I think, more how can we see if there's something that we could repurpose and get to the clinic really quickly. In myelin repair, there was so little known when we started that, that, that we knew we had to start at the discovery biology end. And so the first thing we did is, is again, coming at this like you would a startup company, I began by thinking, you know, what kind of expertise do we need? Uh, who literally is the best scientist in the world in each of those areas? And once we identified them, and that took us about nine months to, to, to answer those two questions, we flew them out to Silicon Valley and we said, we'll fund you, but only if we work together with you to put together a research plan. Because one thing that stunned me is that disease organizations don't have research plans. And I thought, you know, coming out of a company, you know, you can't have a company without a strategic plan and you can't run a research department without a research plan. And so it's not surprising that we're not getting things to the clinic faster when you don't have any kind of plan. So the first thing we did with our team is, is we worked with them to put together a research plan. We said, we'll only fund you if, if you work collaboratively. And, and this is a true collaboration where we had very specific goals and objectives, which, and again, I think it's one thing, I think a lot of pharmaceutical companies now are, are looking at new ways that they could try and, you know, use academic research to, 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 be, to, to foster the front end of their pipelines. But I think one of the difficulties is, you know, academics are very wary of companies um, and don't want to sell out and really have no knowledge of what the pharmaceutical industry does. So one of the things we knew we had to do was work very closely with them. And so we are very involved on a daily basis. We now have 10 different labs we fund and a large team, by far the largest team dedicated to monopair in the world. And so we add so much value and we have this, this, this scientific advisory board that's very involved. And so it's a brain trust where everything is shared within the team uh, in real time. And we protect the intellectual property, which is, I think, is something very different. We actually, because um, we felt like industry needs freedom to operate. They need to know if we've made a discovery that, it's, that they can invest the money to move it forward. And so we uh, have a, uh, applied for 20 US patents. We have seven that have issued. Um, so that's some, th some things we've done on, on kind of in the front end to accelerate the academic research. We then realized that industry can't tell what of those basic science discoveries are truly relevant or interesting. I mean, there was a great study that came out earlier this year where, where Amgen had tried to replicate uh, some papers in the oncology area that they thought were really good research. And out of 53 papers that they identified that had been in really good journals, they could only replicate, I think it was six. So what we realized we needed to do was to basically de-risk the discoveries that had been made in our labs to industry standards so that industry could then decide whether it made sense to move them in. So, so we developed something we, which we call our translational medicine platform. And so we take assays that we've invested in in our academic labs, we move them in, we actually opened our own lab with our own staff, and we, we actually bulk those assays up where we can have a higher throughput and more consistency. And it was interesting because within a month of the time that we opened our lab, we actually had a company, first company, come to us and say, look, we have some compounds that we think have minor pair potential, but your assays are better than anything we have. Can we pay you to test them? And I think it's the first instance where you know, a company has come to a nonprofit and said, can we, you know, we'll, we'll pay you to, to provide data to us. So we see it as, as really um, how we can add value to pharma, how we can add value to academics, and, and ultimately to patients. But it's, it's, it's really a, trying to think differently about how we perform in each step of that value chain. So if you're identifying ways to not only rethink this value chain and your role in it, but obviously add value to those key stakeholders, uh, so many people are looking to both of you as models to the future. But as you know, living these diseases, uh, there's a great sense of urgency personally in the larger industry. What, as we wrap up, uh, one, one minute, I always look at the time clock, um, speaking of urgency, uh, what's the one thing that we need to think about in terms of how we can more quickly accelerate this type of model and collaboration? Because I know it's very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. I know the initial partnerships um, are very cumbersome. 
how can we leverage uh, this type of environment and the like to scale what you're doing across organizations or with other companies? So I think um, that you're talking about knowledge transfer, really. And I think what happens is, um, you know, you've seen this today. In order to change the nonprofit sector, 90% of nonprofits never raise $1 million. In order to do what we do, we have to raise money. We've raised over $210 million, and you have to invest that wisely. And so I think what's made us a little bit different is the fact that we were able to raise the money and that we had the business and scientific savvy and we found the right partners to actually get it done. Knowledge transfer can only happen when you're transferring knowledge to another team that would have the skill sets to take it on. So we have to raise enough money that we have a chief medical officer with an MD and a chief scientific officer and a team of PhDs and a team of masters of public health. You have to make sure that who you're transferring it to could really pull it off. And I think that's the dilemma right now. So in the meantime, some of the things that we're doing are some of the best groups, Michael J. Fox, Cystic Fibrosis, ourselves, Myelin Repair, we, we do get together. For example, Harvard has a, a meeting that um, we're involved in once a year. We share all of our business plans. We share our, our case studies. How are we doing this? And we try to share knowledge that way. But I do look for the day where I can just take what we've done and go over and do it in pancreatic or brain. Because I think that's the only way we'll figure out how to move it to another disease. Scott, where, where do you see that, that time coming, or what's, what's that link um, to be able to, to accelerate what Kathy just mentioned? Uh, yeah, well, like Kathy, I think we get questions all the time from other organizations, contacts and say, look, we, we see what you're doing. Can you tell us how to do it? Yeah. And we feel really bad right now because we're really so focused on, on trying to do what we're doing. And I really see our model as a work in progress. We, we, we know there's a lot more issues we need to figure out innovative solutions to. So you're absolutely correct. I mean, I would love to be able to, when an organization contacts us, say, look, here's some seed money, and we'll give you some consulting help to help you know, implement this. We're not there, we're not there yet. Um, but that is one of our goals, is to do that. And, and I think just to kind of to wrap up a little bit, a lot of people say, well, what you're doing sounds really simple and straightforward. And it is. I mean, it, it is very common sense what both of us are doing. But it's actually pretty difficult to implement because we're dealing with, with, with people and systems that have kind of evolved over decades. Uh, and I think that one thing we find even with, you know, with our academic team, we really literally, like I said, work with them on a daily basis. We have our staff in their labs frequently, even you know, working with the students and postdocs. But the gravitational pull in academia to be an individual contributor and to stay in your own silo is really strong. And so I think it's just going to be demonstrating successes that I think will then make it easier for others to be able to adopt these models in the future. And I think you know, the, the, the more successes we can demonstrate, the easier it will be for others to, to follow on. Well, I want to thank you both because uh, both for your incredible stories, but also the examples that you've set in terms of the ways in which we can think, uh, rethink models that, that, that uh, many people have, have given up on in terms of accelerating the type of, of change that we need, and also for the ways in which you're setting models for the future, not just within your respective diseases, but as we all know, there are far more battles that we need to conquer in that space. So I thank you for that extraordinary work, your passion, and the knowledge sharing that you did here. Well, thank you. Thank you.